Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Pleasure. Tough names. It's going to be more of a discussion with, uh, yeah, yeah, with all these Cajun names, Opelousas, Estopanol, and everything else. It's kind of a mess. Um, get a little feedback here. What we want to talk to you about today, and more of a discussion than a, than a presentation, is uh, our firm has developed this planning strategy around efficient design plus productive care over the many years that we've been around. We'll be 26 years old this year. Uh, we've worked with Bud on numerous large projects uh, prior to uh, this one, but this became a new Greenfield campus, and we had, had the opportunity to fully expand efficient design plus productive care and see what the results would be. And they've been very phenomenal, to be honest with you. And, and uh, Bud can speak to the hospital executive side. I'm going to whip through very quickly uh, kind of the design side of this thing. Uh, I think I've got this figured out. Which, there we go. What we're going to talk about today is basically we'll, we'll make some introductions, which we've already done. We're going to talk about a clinical procedural platform here. Uh, it's uh, the second floor of, of Bud's Hospital, and it's a highly efficient, high-performance uh, clinical platform. We're going to talk about a decision management uh, timeline that we use to implement this. If we're not asking the right questions of the right people at the right times, we usually aren't going to come up with the right answer. So it's, it's very important as to how we ask that and when we ask that. The clinical procedural platform will go through some of their benefits, but the big key is this ROI impact. And, and that's going to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty stunning because there were very, very few clinical changes that occurred going from the old hospital to the new one, uh, other than we had them thinking in a different mindset through the collaborative design process, and they were working from a different platform. Uh, I likened uh, some of our facilities that we, ha we work with are 1960, 1970 vintage facilities, and then they've had five, six, seven, ten, twelve additions on them. So all the efficiencies and, and, and productivity things that were there in the 60s and 70s are now no longer there. We now have the opportunity in many of these cases to go back and re-engineer these buildings or do new ones, as in this case. But it's sort of like trying to win the triple crown on a mule sometimes, and, and it's, it's really a very difficult process that you all have. So then we'll have hopefully some time for Q&A. Uh, in the full interest of disclosure, uh, Bud and I are great friends. We've had a wonderful working relationship. So uh, if, if he says anything about me, he probably means it. And if I say anything about him, I probably mean it too. So it's, uh, we've had a great working relationship. It's been fun. Um, his facility. Uh, is in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, southern part of the state, uh, known for uh, wonderful food and, and honestly, a, a lot of really nice people. Uh, the facility itself, about 430,000 square feet, 186 beds, and for the planning types to, to be, uh, have this full facility at about 2,300 square feet of bed, it's a very well, you know, it's a very efficiently designed footprint. Uh, we've got circulation just slightly over 10% and about 46 acres on the site. Uh, we did do it at a full master plan of the entire site before we ever started construction of the main hospital. So we really know how it's going to expand in the future. Uh, and it's doing that with the addition of a recent surgical hospital that does affect some of these surgical volumes. Um, the clinical procedural platform is a key and apologize for kind of a muddy PDF. But over here, the clinical procedural platform involves emergency imaging, invasive cardiology, surgery, uh, the surgical uh, prep recovery areas in the PACU, and then a very innovative flex unit here. It's about 6,000 square feet. Uh, at $300 a foot is what we built this hospital for, just slightly under that. That's about a $1.8 million uh, area, that flex unit. And what we do is in the morning, they use it for prep and recovery, for surgery. And in the afternoon, they hard clean it and they move, it, they move uh, ED patients in there after the doc's office is closed. And we save a ton of square footage. We save 6,000 square feet, and it works like a charm for them. 
The uh, quarters, well, excuse me, the, the, the design elements of this clinical procedural platform, uh, number, excuse me, number one is going to be circulation. It has to be very clear and direct. It cannot be circuitous because we're depending on moving people efficiently. We're dependent on moving supplies efficiently. And we have to reduce these travel distances. So as we design, those are all, all common denominators we're constantly looking at. Second thing is the departmental adjacencies. We look for direct access from one department to another, and we absolutely look at frequency of interaction. That has to be evaluated so that we understand what departments are working closely with others. And if they're not working closely with others and they don't meet our benchmarking, we start asking questions how we can get them working more closely with others. Uh, next one would be visibility. From every patient care area, the more staff uh, points of staff uh, and patient interaction you can have, the greater visibility to each one of those, staffs, uh, those patient stations, the lower your staffing will be. We've got great evidence-based design research that shows that. So that means we have to deal with a lot fewer walls and we have a lot greater visibility. Well, there's a balance there. We, we start dealing with HIPAA issues, confidentiality and everything else, but we absolutely have to be focused on that visibility. And then lastly, expandability. Uh, I have yet to find a client who said this is the last project's ever going to happen on this campus. Uh, I've had a couple of them jokingly tell me that, and then about six months later we're doing something else there. But in truth of the matter, if you're not designing every project that you're doing right now with the next step in mind, you're missing a golden opportunity. So that's why we locate major departments on exterior walls for multiple directions of expandability without destroying what you just spent great money on. I'm whipping through these fairly quickly and we do have books in the back so there will be uh, opportunity for you to take, take the uh, volume five with you. But a uh, little, little bit more about that is in the document. But again, circulation, adjacencies, visibility and expandability are the keys. Uh, the decision management timeline that's the part where we're asking great questions at the right times of the right people. It also goes back to how clear you're conveying innovative ideas to your staff. If they do not understand what you're asking them to agree on, they're likely going to push back. So you have to have really clear graphics and explain those benefits to them so that they, you build consensus and you get buy-in to get the kind of results that Bud will show you in a moment. But throughout the entire design process, and it's, it's, it, there's nothing different about this process. We start with visioning, we talk about programming, we talk about concepts, schematics, design development, construction documents, and on through the process. It's how you walk your staff through that process and how you're helped through that process by your consultants. That's the key. And in the document, you'll start to see of all these phases of the project, you'll start to see uh, very efficient design and productive care ideas on what you should be looking for at every one of those steps. So I hope you do grab that document. How do we collaborate to get this kind of build, uh, build up and consensus? We had 170 meetings between Bud's staff and my staff. We had 105 of his staff involved in the design process. We had 28 of our design team members involved in the process, and it involved a little over 100,000 hours of engagement. So that's how we did it. We kept track of this throughout the entire process we were doing it. We felt like we had something special here, and I think it's proven that to be the case. Who all is involved? Well, there's hospital side, there's a leadership team, a project committee, department leaders, physician leaders. There's a design team of, of, of all the consultants that known to man. Uh, there's construction team of the construction manager and the prime subs. And then there's consultants uh, that may, many times the hospital is hiring directly. People like uh, an equipment planner or a program manager or somebody like that. All of those people are involved at various phases uh, of, that, of that decision management plan. And in the book, it's much more explicit. I didn't want to spend too much time on that today. The clinical procedural platform yeah, really works out 
that we start looking at a, a, an awful lot of data. And I'm going to turn it over to Bud to let him walk you through some of that ROI and the benefits of that. So hopefully we've got a few minutes of uh, some Q&A okay. on, on the right. Good. Thanks. All right. Well, in, in Wayne's triple crown analogy, I guess I'm the mule. So uh, That's not at all what so, I meant. You so know that. I'll do my best. I've got nine slides, and I promise I'm not going to read the slides. None of us, none of us appreciate that. Uh, but what I, what I hope the nine slides do is illustrate some real performance improvements that I think are a combination of a lot of things but could not have been done without the design that we did on what we call our Ambassador Caffrey campus. Lords took on this project because it really was make or break for us. We had been in the market for 50 some years. We were always number two in the market. We were always going to be number two or maybe even number three, given the, the path that the hospital had been on. And so having done a lot of this kind of work in my, my career, I think I was recruited in part particularly for three things. One is culture, the other was community and physician relationships, and the other was strategy related to, I think, institutional improvement and growth. And so this Ambassador Caffrey project became the great evidence of that. And you can see some of the significant numbers now, and this goes, you know, you say emergency department usage is up. Well, no big surprise. It's up nationwide. That's what all the data tells us, correct? But if you look deeper in those numbers, not only is it up, but the QD levels are up, the, the payer mix is better, uh, speed in and out, satisfaction, you know, all those kinds of measurements we look at that go not only with the numbers are up, and I think the facility, the procedure platform, uh, design that, that Wayne and his team came up with really are second to none. Uh, because we have a real integration of the emergency department, surgical department, imaging. Uh, and so those three areas, those are your, your critical patient interrelationships, those are your critical acuity departments working seamlessly together. And so we have one seamless platform as opposed to multiple departments working on a platform. Very different in that regard. You see, in, in surgery, as Wayne mentioned, when we designed the facility, I think one of the great things about the Ambassador Caffrey campus, it's really a plug-and-play philosophy. We had great expectations that our 44 physician partners who make up our surgical hospital that did 10,000 cases or so a year would re agree to relocate to this campus. They did last year plugged it right into the existing building, didn't interrupt our operations on the Ambassador Caffrey campus, the, the main hospital, at all, none, which was fabulous. All we had to do is add some parking spots, build a bridge, connect them through a corridor by our OR, done. And now the procedure platform has is, is, is gone that much further. We have a footprint for a future MOB, we put one on there, actually built the MOB before the, uh, the main hospital was built. And we have a footprint all planned for the heart hospital, which is a joint venture with about 30 cardiologists and CB surgeons. 32-bed hospital we acquired six, seven years ago from Medcath. And we have plans for it to seamlessly move onto the campus the same way in which the uh, Short Stay Surgical Hospital. And by the way, on those volumes, you see a, a, a little, the, and these are all numbers are on the 186 bed Ambassador Caffrey campus. That campus is about a $190 million operation. All Lords together is about $300 million to give you a sense of how big a deal this was for the Lords enterprise. And that, that operation went from, and again designed by Wayne and his team, went from 10,000 cases in the first year alone to 11,000 cases. Uh, and yet the main campus also had an increase, so I think pretty significant. Staffing costs are a big deal, obviously. Whoever's got the highest quality, lowest cost, I think that's existed in my entire 30 years in healthcare. If you've got those two metrics, you're going to have an opportunity to lead your market. And I think particularly as we go from uh, volume to value, it's really critical. Well, you can see that our cost per case relative to FTs continue to go down. In fact, overall, when we began this project at our old campus, our um, net um, 
salary and wage versus our net revenue was about 46%. And now we're 38.5%. So it's been a significant reduction uh, in our costs. And you can see some of the metrics associated with that, whether it's imaging, surgical, or, or emergency department. We're seeing more with less. And I don't see any end in that trend, quite frankly, because our costs are relatively fixed and we think we can still squeeze a lot more volume out of the current employee mix that we have. So and we continue to have growth and expect growth year over year for the next several years. Again, I recognize that's not necessarily a universal trend in all markets. You, uh, you can see some of these comparisons. You know, it, it's, you see actually some numbers. You say, well, geez, you know, some numbers have gone up. But they have, but they've gone up at an amount less than the increase in volume relative to productivity. It isn't about having fewer, right? In fact, I really loved, for those of you who were in Warner Thomas's presentation earlier, I thought it was a fabulous presentation about culture. And we could talk a lot about the Ambassador Caffrey project in relation to how it was designed, the tools we used to engage our medical staff, our nursing staff, our community. We had, in fact, one of our themes, we had lots of themes associated with the project. One was designed with you in mind. So when Wayne talks about the 170 uh, visits, uh, interactions, I'm surprised. It, in fact, I'm sure it was much more than that on our side relative to the number of physicians or nurses or community members, patients and their families that we got involved in focus groups helping us with the design. And we can talk lots of Wayne and I about that. So it, it, it really is significant for us. Satisfaction, we've been pleased. over the, Now we always, we were never terrible. In fact, I would say that was the Lord's story. I think, we, I think good was the enemy of great. Lord's always had about a 60%. This is, by the way, on the all press Ganey database, not hospitals from 100 to 250 beds. You know, because press Ganey, you know, stratifies about hospital size. This is against the all hospital database, which is weighted more heavily towards the smaller institutions. In the institutions from a, between 100 and 250 beds, we're pleased that we're above the 95th percentile consistently through Press Ganey and have received their recognition in the last two years in that regard. So our patient satisfaction has grown from the 60th percentile to the 90 plus percentile in these several years. Again, not all building. I certainly would argue that we did an awful lot of things in the culture and leadership development, all those kind of things that we do every day. But I think they go hand in hand very nicely. For example, one little thing. You want nurses to be engaged. If the average age of the nurse in America is 48 years, uh, 48 years old, my guess is if you can reduce the number of steps that 55 or 60 year old nurse walks in a 12 hour shift, you're gonna make a difference. The most a nurse can walk in our design is seven rooms worth of distance. That's the most. And we think it saves thousands and thousands of steps per nurse per day. And what does that do for your engagement and satisfaction? So we've talked a little bit about the overall facility performance. You can see the net revenue number going significantly up. And again, we're trending for this year another double-digit increase in the year that we're currently in. And we're exceeding budget. So we're very pleased by what it's done relative to financial performance. And again, I don't think I can state it enough, could not be done in my estimation if we had simply retrofitted the old facility. I think that doesn't do much, nor could it have been done if we didn't have the kind of design and efficiencies that we built into this project. And, and Wayne is right. Uh, we've been friends for quite some time. We've worked off and on now probably for 15 plus years together in various projects. I've done a lot of work with a lot of architectural firms, HOK, and, and a bunch of them. We've all probably done that. I, I don't know of any that has the ability to speed to market, creative design, ability to work with staff, particularly physicians, in such a compelling and complete way as TEG. Uh, uh, unpaid testimonial <laughs> to Wayne and his team. And again, some more examples of the financial report uh, results of what we've done at Ambassador Caffrey. So, I think with that, 
Uh, hopefully you've got a good uh, a sense of kind of what we did. I'll add a couple little comments as Wayne gets up here. Uh, I think our uh, approach to design with you in mind was critical. We had seven key stakeholder groups. We asked each one of them, if it was your hospital, what would you want? From that exercise, whether it was patients or nursing staff or physicians, each of the seven stakeholder groups, we didn't get all of their wishes, but we were able to get most of them. So if you ask any one of those groups, it is their hospital, not administration's hospital. And that makes a huge difference. And so I would encourage you to work with Wayne or whoever you work with in the future to look at your, your design and accumulation of data process to make it all work out. So It's been a great collaboration. And, and we've got five volumes of, uh, of this book, and we've got the fifth volume back here for you today if you wish to take it with you. But uh, the first two deal with kind of uh, time and motion studies of emergency departments. Volume two is uh, high performance emergency department design. Volume three was some master planning. How do we integrate efficient design plus productive care into the overall campus? Volume four is 17 different nursing unit configurations. We used Soaring to do the staffing analysis of all of these, so we rated them all, plus five different patient room configurations, one of which is, uh, is Bud's patient room configuration, which is a, a pretty cool space. And uh, then the last one's this ROI of facility design piece. And, and Sandy Johnson can uh, uh, take your card or, or whatever. We'll send you all five volumes, and you don't have to haul them back with you. But uh, we'd be happy to, to forward those to you. But uh, at, with that, I think we're, uh, we can, we've got a few minutes for Q&A. And, &A and uh, uh, we hope you've got a few questions, and especially a bud on the operations side. Go ahead. Yeah, we don't really have a problem with any of the confidentiality. And, and as Bud said, like even from the nursing center, the, the most they'll walk is seven rooms. But the nice thing is they can visualize all seven of those doors from the nursing center. Um, it, it really did not become that big of an issue. It's not like we just eliminated all the walls. It, it really has to do with how you locate those staff spaces. Um, we just took a tour of Parkland Hospital a couple of weeks ago, a $1.3 billion replacement hospital in Dallas. And if you probably a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to see that because it's not operational yet. And Plain Tree and uh, Center for Health Design had a big tour there a couple of weeks ago. And the interesting thing there, they're utilizing very many of the same design strategies we did on Bud's Hospital but they've really shrunk down the staff spaces. And I, I, I'm, it'll be interesting to see how that works out, but it all goes back to, in their mind, there's so much going to be, much more is going to be bedside than it ever was at the nursing center. And, and we've touched on that with, with Bud's nursing stations throughout the entire facility, but uh, it, the HIPAA thing has not been a real issue. I, I, you can address Yeah, and, that. and you know, in one, in one example, just one, would be we actually admit at the bedside. So a person comes in our downstairs area. In fact, we, we used a Disney concept that Wayne helped us with. When you come into the hospital, you do not see a physician, you do not see a patient, you do not see a stretcher, you don't see any care going on uh, on stage. It's all happening backstage. And so when someone comes in our admitting area, they go to the, the front desk reception, looks very similar to what you'd see here. At, at O Spa, and then you're escorted to your room, and all that work is done there. So that's just something that we've done to try to, at least in part, both create a more friendly customer experience, but it certainly has some HIPAA advantages, clearly, when we do that as well. If I could ask a follow-up yes, question Michael. regarding that type of uh, interaction. What type of discussion do you have regarding nursing units and universal patients? Well, that, that, was, that was big for us. We, again, we had a lot of little thoughts as we put down on paper what we wanted. One of them was designed with you in mind. The other was safest hospital in America. That was one of our goals. 
and, and I could show you an awful lot of quality data that, that supports the financial data. This presentation was about ROI, but I can tell you that our quality metrics are really strong. And so that's how we got the same handed rooms. That every room, in fact, the only difference between our ICUs and the other, the other floors, other units, is that it has a breakaway door. Uh, otherwise, everything's the same. ICUs have restrooms. Beds in our facility, every bed is on the left side of the room, as you're looking at me on this side, <laughs> as you walk into the room. And you know how we got there? We decided we wanted same handed because we wanted every room to look the same. Thought if you had to have a nurse come from five and work a shift on three or four to six, whatever it would be, we wanted them to feel like everything was exactly in the same place, and it is exactly in the same place. Well, we put the bed on the left side of the room as you walk in, and that really came because we weren't, weren't sure left side, right side, and it was a it was a one of our senior general surgeons who said, "Well, Bud, you absolutely got to have it on the left side." Well, why is that, Doc? Because we almost universally um, review people on the right side of their body. That's where we examine them. And if you put it on the left side, nobody has to walk around the bed to get to the patient for an examination. Now, I remember that conversation vividly. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Gary Arnold. And I'm thinking, okay, that's seven steps. We counted them to walk around the bed. Now, seven steps times every patient interaction times every bed, every, you know, you can do the math on that. It's pretty remarkable. And it allowed us to have a room design that had the patients in the back and their families in the back of the room, the caregivers in the front of the room, and they never had to cross paths. So it created it made, some really uh, very yeah. distinct zones that as you entered the door, you had the staff, staff zone, then the patient zone around the bed, and family zone beyond. And one of the keys to, and I'm going to steal the light com comment, uh, one of the wonderful things that the families enjoy is the fact that right over their lounge chair area is a single light that they control. No nurse can control that light. You know, So they, they feel like they've got their own space. We've got recharging outlets over there and some shelving and things for them. So uh, the, the concept of the universal patient room we really took it to a standardized patient room, all same-handed, and uh, for all the reasons Bud's outlined. And we had all the things you would expect, right? We have room service. Patients get what they want when they want it between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., and their families can order meals ahead of time. We'll have it waiting for them as they come. Uh, you know, wireless uh, keyboards connecting to uh, the Internet at the bedside, all those kinds of things. Nobody wants to be in a hospital bed, right? So we want to make this as good an experience as we possibly can. One of the keys to the patient satisfaction we've looked at, obviously, you know, most of us see 50% of our admissions coming through the ED. So we try to really streamline that process. But these patients and families spend so much time on that nursing unit. It's an absolute key to your HCAP scores. We, we, it's what we're finding. <clears throat> Went to open ICU, for example. That was a, one of the many changes from the old institution to the new one, which was a, a radical change for the nursing staff and for the, for the physicians, as you can imagine, but has been a tremendous success. There was a hand. Yeah, we've, we've used Lean and Six Sigma strategies throughout our, our entire process. Uh, we, we, we really think we've taken Lean to a level here that, that is, is absolutely directly applicable to what our clients are doing. As, as Bud referenced, there, they had a lot of meetings besides the 170 we did with focus groups and other things. So what we try to do is we try to blend it through a lean process, and, and we've really, I think, come up with some nice solutions of it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, how many black belts and green belts we have, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a number, and we're, we're also on a, on a Baldridge journey, and so we have three uh, certified Baldridge examiners. So we've deployed a whole lot of different things that were part of this project and then you no know, one going afterwards.
Yes, yes. It, 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 we had a whole series of focus groups that included the doctors, the nurses, various therapy ancillary departments, patients, ex-patients, but ex-patient family members. So because families, are, you know, in many cases, with the average age of our inpatient being significantly higher and getting higher, we all know that in many cases the HCAP scores aren't patient scores. They're patient family scores on behalf of the patient. So we put them in on the front end. That's um, you know, one of the reasons, for example, that we don't have any um, structured parking. Not yet. I'm afraid with our next big... Um, expansion, we're going to have to do that. It's part of the uh, master plan. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, we discovered that patients, families hated it, at least in our area. So that was in part for that. So with lots of lots of little. That's where we got your, uh, the ability to do room service and for the family members to call in. If they're going to visit Mama at 6 p.m., they can call in at 5 o'clock and a meal's waiting for them at 6 o'clock. They give their credit card over the phone. It's there. Whatever we can do to make it easier. In the back. I go to Lafayette about once a year, and when I go there, I have to go by the hospital. Well, you're kind to say that. We... Again, a design concept that Wayne, I can't tell you how many hours we spent with Wayne. We bought this 45-acre piece of property and did a lot of dif different modeling, both for energy reasons as well as aesthetic reasons, where to put it, how to angle it. And uh, one of the thoughts that we had was that healing would begin the minute they saw the facility. Yep. And we think that's by and large true. So, thanks for saying that. Yes, sir. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, and, and I'm not a big fan of outsourcing much of what we do, but we do use Sodexo as a partner. So they have been a terrific partner for us as we looked at our design for patient and family conveniences. They were terrific at helping us read. Uh, in fact, had a big influence on the design of the kitchen. Their staff worked very effectively with Wayne's team. So how we designed the kitchen, not only for the 186 beds that are there now, but we anticipated Park Place moving, the Heart Hospital moving, uh, the two power patient towers can go up two more floors from the six current floors, and we can add a third tower. So we, we, we suspect within the next 20 years that 186 main hospital bed hospital will go to about 300 beds and we built the kitchen capacity to do it and it's on an outside wall yeah <laughs> yeah. I have a question. yeah from a practical standpoint when you're looking at clinically integrated organizations and yet you're looking at staff space i think you mentioned parkland having small staff space can you talk about staff space for nurses versus physicians that you have designated physician space Dining room, and then uh, what's your thoughts on how that goes especially sure. As Bud alluded, we have this front of house, back of house idea, and, and where the staff spaces are located, and I'll give you a quick example. On the first level, just inside uh, the, from the exterior, from the physician parking, is all of the, the sta all the physician space. I'll, there's a lot of answers to your question. I'll use this example for brevity. Uh, there's the physician's dining area. It's right there by all the med records. But they also, we've designed a space there where they can pick up the iPad and go on into the, into the clinical floors and use the iPad as they go around uh, to make rounds. It, it's really been very integrated in the flow of the, of the entire hospital. So we, we, we had a lot of discussions about where this would be located and what it would be. Uh, so to, to simply have space for physicians that are, is not on their normal path of travel, it probably will not be utilized very well. So those, those, those big highways in the, in the back of house where you're going to have all this interaction, uh, that's, that's prime real estate there where you can locate that kind of staff space. 
and in this case we used it for physicians. Uh, on the floors and certainly in surgery and every place else, we've got areas of you know, refuge for the, for the staff to get away from what's going on on the floors or in the units. So uh, it, it's been very well thought through at, at every level, but even as an overall facility level, uh, we've, we've had to think about where we were locating those. You may have something to add. Uh, well, I would, I would add a couple of things. That, that space is also next to the medical staff offices and also next to the clinical farm Ds who the physicians interface with quite a bit. So where the physician dining is, is right there in this little hub that we thought would, would work well with the docs. I would say though that we reduced an awful lot of the specialized housing um, for docs or for nurses or for staff in, in favor of team break areas. Uh, we felt that that was critically important to reduce some silos. So versus the old hospital, the new one, there are far less offices, far more common areas for all members of the team to congregate. So we, we have a nice, very nice physician dining area. But other than that, there's not a lot of privacy because it's all about the team, frankly. Yes, sir. Well, what's amazing is the male locker areas look as nice as the female. I, swear, I think that was a big, I think that was a big achievement. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, listen, the lockers are very nice. Uh, and like on the surgical floor, on the second floor, they're adjacent to one another, and um, I think the space is relatively tight but nice. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but we located that that locker room space right outside the surgical sterile corridor area. So it's very easy for the surgery staff. It's a, it's a staff locker room. It's not just a physician locker room. It's a common area for all those who are involved in the, in, in the, in the surgical suite. Uh, again, I'm not sure if I'm answering your to question. To add something to your, maybe your question, we, we worked with Bud's uh, uh, in-house staff on their future staffing models based on what surgery was going to be and what PACU and prep and recovery would be. So it wasn't uh, as if we just picked a number. We certainly looked at how they were going to have to staff the new footprint and sized it for that. Now, there is a, a little bit of a, a discussion now about having some, you know, demountable walls so that you can easily expand this. Uh, honestly, in a couple days, you could expand either one of them because there's some soft space around both of them, so that we can expand in the future. So, yeah. we limited the, we limited the growth, even though we're still on 45 acres. We limited the potential capacity growth to about 300 inpatient beds for several reasons. One is. In our overall market strategy, we're looking at more of a compass strategy where we see smaller ambulatory, freestanding ERs, other ASC-like activity more so than beds. We think that's the right thing. And we feel like given what we'll do in some of those sites that we've already picked out, one a 50-acre site north of town, we, we suspect that what we'll do is uh, rather than grow beds on the main campus, we'll grow them where the population is. It's a little more distributive network approach. Yes, sir. Did I hear you say the, some, what I call the dog's muscle uh, there goes from being a packer to an ED at night? No. It's, what, what, what exactly did you say? Yeah, yeah. I'll be real quick. The best way to show you is to look at this one floor plan, and it's the, it's the um, flex, space. flex space. Oops, went too far. This flex space right here, this gray area, in the morning, patients will come up and go back here and be prepped, go to surgery, have surgery, come back, recover, and out the front, out the discharge uh, point back here. At about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, they clean it up, and then ED patients come through this connection and use that same space. So that gray area, and I apologize, it's not terribly well defined, it's about 6,000 square feet. But had we not gotten these folks to think outside the box a little bit, we would have built another probably 10 or 12 treatment spaces over here, part of PACU, prep recovery, 
and it would have been vacant at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But now this thing is used darn near 24 hours a day, yeah, and we our, saved $1.8 million. Yeah, our 18-bed emergency department goes to 28 beds, nights and heavy peak times. Yes, sir. Oh, oh yeah. Um, which also relates to age cap. But it's really, and, and it's, it's, it's actually much more calmer than what you would see at, you know, I've got a, you know, a 500 bed first year at academic medical center. It's, you know, it's chaos. <laughs> Well, I, I, I really like that phrase, uh, place of healing, because we happen to be a Catholic hospital, you could probably guess by the, the name. And we built a beautiful chapel, stained glass windows, seats about 80 folks. It's the oval altar. space right there at the front. And, and we put that right in the front. And, and so in, in many cases, I tell folks that we built a beautiful chapel and then put a hospital around it. And uh, it really does add to that ambiance that this is a place of, of healing and hopefully for our, both our staff and, and our patients and their families, especially this a place of spiritual renewal. On, on this particular floor, the front of house really is across here and across here, that corridor. That L-shaped space is pretty much the extent of the public. Everything else behind it is all back, back of house. Uh, allowing it to, to have a very calm setting and, and a great feel. Certainly, uh, Wayne Bud, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, as you can see, the audience very much enjoyed it. Uh, and, uh, certainly I thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks Pleasure. for staying.